Hey guys, today we're going to be learning about the ideal gas law. All right, so ideal gas law. Now, the ideal gas law is a mathematical relationship between a number of variables, the pressure, the volume, the number of moles, and the temperature of any ideal gas. When in the last video we talked about kinetic molecular theory, which is the fact that molecules of gas have actual physical properties. They are things, it's matter. So when molecules bounce off of things, they exert a pressure, a force. Molecules moving, it's because they have kinetic energy due to temperature, right? Number of moles is just represented with the number of molecules present and volume because any gas will expand to fill the container that it is in, the volume is simply representative of how much space the gas can fill. So all of these variables are connected. So let's start by discussing how the variables relate to each other. So in a lab, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at how each of these are related mathematically by collecting data. But let me just go ahead and show you these representations off the bat, graphically speaking. First one we're gonna look at, Volume and pressure. Now, in terms of volume, if we think about what happens when we squeeze a gas together, we take a volume and we shrink it, what happens is the molecules of that gas all of a sudden don't have to move quite as far before they start colliding with the walls or with the pressure sensor that you have in that container. So that means more collisions, higher frequency of collisions. Higher frequency of collisions means more force exerted, exerted, more force exerted means greater pressure. That means that as you decrease the volume, the pressure increases. This isn't a linear relationship though, it's an inverse relationship. So that graph's gonna look something like this. This would be an inverse graph. An inverse graph means if I've cut the volume in half, I've actually doubled the pressure. If I've cut the volume by 10, I've increased the pressure by a factor of 10. But mathematically speaking, in a formula, it looks something like this. Pressure times volume would be multiplied together, relatively speaking, to give you a, a constant value. So again, if you double the pressure, you have to cut the volume in half for them to be equal to the same thing. All right, let's look, take a look at the next set of relationships. Let's, instead of looking at pressure and volume, Let's look at temperature and pressure. Now again, going back to kinetic molecular theory, as you increase the temperature, molecules start moving faster and faster and faster and faster, which means not only do they collide more frequently with the walls of your container, but they also are moving faster when they do. They have greater kinetic energy. So in other words, as they collide with the walls, they're moving faster, so it's more frequent, and they have greater force due to their energies. This results in a greater pressure. So in other words, temperature and pressure are directly related. Graph's gonna look something like this. That means if you double the temperature, you also would double the pressure. Okay, we're gonna actually look at this relationship again in a laboratory setup. But what that tells us is that temperature and pressure must be on opposite sides of an equal sign. So what I'm gonna do is gonna go ahead and throw my temperature on the other side of the equal sign. Okay, another way you can think about this in terms of a proportion is that it would be P over T or T over P is always equal to the same exact ratio, all right? So pressure and temperature. Now we're gonna look at the last variable, which is gonna be number of moles. All right, so let's look at number of moles now. We represent number of moles in chemistry with the lowercase n. So when I see the lowercase n, what I'm really saying is number of moles. Well, let's think about this. Your car has air in its tires. As we start to squeeze more air into the tires using a gas compressor, what happens is the tire will inflate, but at some point it stops inflating. The volume can no longer change. Once the volume stops changing, what's happening is the pressure starts to increase. So what you see is more gas in the container, going again back to kinetic molecular theory, means you end up with more collisions, more frequent collisions. The molecules might not have more energy, but there are just more of them. So they're gonna collide more frequently with the wall, 
thereby exerting more force and greater pressure. Again, just like with temperature, number of moles is going to see a direct relationship to the pressure. Which again tells us it's going to be on the other side of the equation. So right now we have a situation where we have PV, which are inversely related to each other. We have N, which is directly related to P, and T, which is directly related to P. Now you'll notice I always go back to pressure here. There's a reason. It's easier for me to conceptualize pressure. I have a hard time conceptualizing how the number of moles impacts volume or temperature impacts volume directly. I always tend to go back to pressure and then use the relationships that kind of come out of that to relate each other um, to themselves. But here's the thing. PV does not equal NT. If I do this math, I find that the values aren't equal to each other. There's something missing. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the thing that's missing. So the thing that's missing in this whole process is something that we refer to as the gas constant. Now the gas constant is, as the name suggests, a constant value. This constant value relates the actual uh, relationships between pressure, volume, number of moles, and temperature. So as you see, based on what we just determined using our graphs, pressure and vol volume are inversely related. Pressure and number of moles, pressure and temperature, those are directly related. Therefore, you can see the relationships between each of these variables. In order to come up with a mathematical, quantitative way of doing calculations, the gas constant was developed. And the gas constant is represented by the capital letter R. And there are actually a few values that R can take on. The value that R takes on is based on the units that you're going to be using for your pressure and or what you're going to be looking for. So when we talk about thermochemistry, oftentimes we actually use an R value that involves joules, whereas in gas law we tend to use it in atmospheres or millimeters of mercury or tor. Now the cool thing is, the nice thing is, you're never going to have to memorize these R values. They're always going to be given to you on a formula sheet. So they're not meant to be memorized, but you do need to understand when to input each one. And that's going to be based on the units, generally, of your pressure. OK. So now that we've already come to the determination of the relationships between all of our different variables and the existence of this gas constant, we have now developed what we know as the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law represents any gas behaving like an ideal gas, which remember in the last video we talked about follows those assumptions, the assumptions that no collisions are inelastic, so any, anytime they're bouncing off they don't lose any energy, the fact that molecules don't interact with each other, and the fact that the molecules of gas we assume don't take up any space themselves. If those assumptions are valid, which oftentimes they are, this equation is going to be utilized. PV equals NRT. Another way you can often hear it is Pivnert. PV equals NRT is one of the few equations that you are going to be using in so many of these units. But again, it's going to be given to you on the formula sheet. However, it is one of the easier ones to remember. So let's start with the practice problem. We're going to apply our ideal gas law here using this problem where we're looking for the pressure of a 35 milliliter metal gas canister that contains 0.5 moles of a compressed gas at 15 Celsius. So this is a prototypical ideal gas law type question where I'm given volume, moles, temperature, and I'm looking for pressure. Sometimes you're going to be given other variables, but in all, generally within your ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, you're always looking for one of those variables. So let's start by rewriting our ideal gas law and identifying what variables we have so that we know what we need to solve for. Pressure is what we're looking for. We need an atmosphere, so I'm just going to go at X, volume, 35 milliliters. Number of moles is 0.5. and temperature is 15 Celsius. Now one thing we also don't have yet is R. 
R, as I just said in the last part of this video, was the gas constant. And picking the R value is completely dictated by the units that we're using in this actual process. In this case, atmospheres is our unit of pressure. So we need to find the R that represents atmospheres. That happens to be zero point zero eight two zero six liters per mole Kelvin. Wait, liters? Well here we're in milliliters. So we need to get that to liters. And Kelvin, well here we're in Celsius. So we need to get that to Kelvin. So let's do some quick conversions to get us into the units we need to be able to plug into our ideal gas law. So we're going to divide our volume by a thousand. And add 273.15 to our temperature in Celsius. So now we have all the variables we need. We've got our volume in liters, we've got our number of moles, and we've got our temperature in Kelvin. Kelvin's really important in gas laws because of the fact that, remember, these relationships are based off of the energy of particles. Kelvin scales perfectly with that kinetic energy because, remember, zero Kelvin is absolute zero, no kinetic energy, no molecular movement at all. If we use Celsius, then what we end up with is the potential for negative values. We can't have negative kinetic energy. That's just not physically possible. So we need to use Kelvin in all circumstances within our gas law unit. So here we've got our values, and now we're just going to plug it in and solve for our unknown. All right, so we've got 0 0.0035 liters, 0.5 moles, our R value that we chose based off the units, and our temperature in Kelvin. We solve for X, and we end up with a value of 338 atmospheres. That means with only half a mole of gas in this container, we have a pressure that is 338 times the atmospheric pressure here at our uh, sea level. So incredible pressure within this small container. Again, it doesn't take a whole lot of gas to exert a whole lot of pressure. So the first practice problem we looked at was a setup where we're already given all the variables except for one. In this one, we're actually going to have to go through a slightly different process. I'm given a chemical reaction where I've got sodium carbonate reacting with hydrochloric acid. Now, if you remember back, anytime a metal carbonate reacts with an acid, it produces three things. It produces water, produces a salt, and it produces carbon dioxide, which is a gas. So we've got water, salt, and, a carb and carbon dioxide being produced as a course of this neutralization reaction. Now here's the thing. I'm not given moles. I need moles. But I am given grams. But in this case, it's grams of hydrochloric acid. So I need to figure out not grams of hydrochloric acid, that's not my gas. I need to figure out moles of carbon dioxide. Because when I do PV equals NRT, it's the pressure of carbon dioxide. It's the volume of carbon dioxide. It's the number of moles of carbon dioxide, and it's the temperature of carbon dioxide in this situation. So what I'm going to do is first solve for moles of CO2. Remembering back to stoichiometry, we need to make sure we go from grams of hydrochloric acid to moles of HCl first. We do this using its molar mass of 36.458. Now that we're in moles of hydrochloric acid, we're going to convert it into moles of carbon dioxide. Again, that's where we need to get to. So we're going into moles of carbon dioxide, which means we're using our mole ratio. One mole of carbon dioxide for two moles of HCl. This is going to give me a value of 1.23 moles of carbon dioxide produced. Well, now I've got moles. Now I've got moles and I've got temperature and pressure as well, which means I can plug into my ideal gas law. So let's go ahead and do that.
Remember, we need to pick the correct R. In this case, our unit of uh, pressure is in atmosphere, so we need to pick 0 0.08206. And when solving for X, we end up with a volume of 0 0.641 liters. That means in a course of this reaction, I've produced 0.641 liters of carbon dioxide gas. So this is an example where we can use stoichiometry and then use that value of moles that we calculate using stoichiometry in our ideal gas law to find the volume of a product. Now the next thing we need to discuss is this equation. Now this equation is not going to be given to you. This is actually derived, and we'll talk in class about how it's derived. But the idea here is that we can connect in another variable that we haven't yet really discussed, density. Now density of a gas is really important. The reason density of a gas is important is because gases, by their nature, have both mass and volume. And remember, density is mass divided by volume. So it may, stands to reason that somehow density is connected to both temperature and pressure. Well, this makes sense because hot air balloons rise because they're less dense. Well, if they're rising because they're less dense, it's they're hot air balloons, which means as temperature goes up, density must go down. Well, that means that they must be on the same side of the equation. So it's temperature and density are inversely related. Right? That's why a hot air balloon rises. It's more buoyant due to its lower density. So when we look at this equation, I will tell you how to memorize this. It's called the molar cat, molar mass kitty cat. There's my molar mass kitty cat. Forgive the art. But here's the key to any good kitty cat. Any good kitty cat covers their pee with dirt. This is how we can remember the molar mass kitty cat. Molar mass, big M, is equal to DRT, so density times our gas constant times our temperature in Kelvin, divided by the pressure. Many times we can use this to determine the identity of a gas. So by identifying the molar mass of the gas, we can then identify the gas itself. We can also use prediction, make predictions based off of the relative mass of a gas as to how it pertains to its pressure or density depending on other circumstances. This is a very common equation that you will need to use and it's not given to you, which means either you're going to have to derive it or memorize the molar mass kitty cat. All right, so let's go ahead and apply the molar mass kitty cat. In this case, we are given a problem where I'm given temperature, pressure, and density, and I can just plug into my molar mass kitty cat equation. In this case, I'm given the density, but sometimes you might just be given the grams and the liters, right? which means you'd have to solve for density, but that's okay. You can do that. The idea here is we need to plug in. Remember to pick the right R. The R value in this case, because we're in millimeters of mercury, is going to be 62.36. All right, so make sure you're using the correct R value. Also, make sure you're converting your, kel your temperature into Kelvin. All right, so negative 16.73 Celsius. It's the same thing as 256.42 Kelvin. If we solve, our molar mass comes out to 84.06 grams per mole. which just happens to be the molar mass, or darn close to the molar mass, of krypton, which means that I could probably say that this gas in this container is, in fact, krypton. All right, so that wraps up today's video. Today we learned about how to apply data into the ideal gas law. So the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, is one of the most commonly used equations in AP chemistry, and it can be derived into another commonly used equation that I like to call the molar mass kitty cat whereas molar mass is equal to DRT over P. Remember, all good kitty cats cover their P with dirt. That's the mnemonic you can use. I want to thank Genevieve Malat and Dia Gopal for writing, filming, and editing this video. I'd like to thank you guys for watching it, and I'll see you in the next one.